Hey everyone, and welcome back to this special edition of Cannabis Capital's Pop Politics. We're here live in Las Vegas on the floor of G4, and I want to tell you right now, I'm really excited to be joined by the man behind the madness, so to speak, but this great event, Mr. Keith Allen, CEO of G4 Live. Thanks for joining us, Keith. Are you live yet? No, it isn't. Hit the button. We got to get them live here, everybody. G4 Live here in Las Vegas. I got to get live. There I am. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> so, Keith, I, I want to say thank you first and foremost for having us be part of this. This is a great event. Do me a little favor. Give me the overview of what G4 Live is, and then we'll talk a little bit at the end of that about what the Bud Tender Awards are before we dig into some of these politic topics that were political topics we're going to get into. Sure, and thank you again for having me. Uh, G4 Live is a very special event in the sense that we do things a little bit differently than other shows do. The G in G4 stands for global. Four represents the four corners of the cannabis universe that can be found everything from seed to sale. Live stands for lifestyle, innovation, value, and education. It's important to be able to bring a professionalized event together that also incorporates lifestyle. So when you come to an event like ours, you'll notice that the booths are a little bit bigger. They're a little bit more separated. It gives time for people to talk and do good deals. And we heard yesterday of millions of dollars of deals being done on our floor uh, yesterday. So it's, it's, it's an exciting time for us to be able to bring a professionalized event to this industry, really to help shift the stigma away from weed. But it still respects the culture. Absolutely. And then, so, and then Bud Tender Awards is a big part of the culmination of the G4 Live experience, right? Yes, of course. We started as the Bud Tender Awards. So the Bud Tender Awards, the first Bud Tender Awards was 2019. We were at Mandalay Bay, an MGM property. We were the first ever cannabis-related event that was allowed on a Las Vegas Strip casino. And MGM owns 24, 25 properties on the Strip. So when we had our first show, we had a much smaller trade show in a ballroom. There was maybe like 30, 40 booths there. But we, we had the senior vice president of MGM International, the CEO, their chief compliance officer, the federal gaming commissioner, and attorneys and general counsels from the Wynn and Caesars come visit our show because it was such a big deal. But the bud tenders are the core of everything. And I say that because the bud tenders are really the front line. They represent everything from the brands to the consumers. I mean, think about it, regulation around advertising is so limited and what people can do and what they can talk about from the brand perspective, how else do you get information about the product? Right, and so that's what I wanted to get into right there on that. So as pop politics is a show, right, it's focused on these issues. What do you see, right? So you're someone now as a national perspective. I've seen brands here represented from throughout the country in the markets where there's legalized cannabis. What are the, some of the challenges that still exist that you, know, you can point to as, as common ground issues that our industry should be working on together? I think with the, I mean, look, if you're talking about from the governmental side or from the yeah, yeah, well, side. yeah, well, I think from the governmental side, sure. You talk about advertising, you talk about reaching consumers, creating, you know, this this industry. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you had to overcome or help, you know, live through to get to where we're having a G4 Live like this, you know? And, I think and, the biggest issue we're all dealing with is clarity, right? Because nobody's really talking about anything substantive. It's almost like what's the password to get in, right? When you talk about the government, I think it's a big misconception that the DEA has to deschedule cannabis. It's more about the state regulations. It's about the people that have given tax benefits to cultivators and growers in these states that want to protect the tax revenue that's coming in from that operation. I mean, we already know they overcharge them on the taxes. It's ridiculous. However, if the government were, the U.S., if the feds were to deschedule cannabis, they would have theoretically open border. California would crush the rest of the country. It would destroy Nevada. It would destroy all the other states, maybe with the exception of maybe Colorado and Oregon. But the reality is, is that California weed is what everybody wants across the state. So the regulators and this, the state legislations are working hard to stop that from happening. So to get cannabis descheduled from the governmental side has way more to do with the states than the feds. Right. And, and from that perspective, okay, when you were putting together this show, how did you get the government, you know, all the leadership you just talked about? I know the casino properties are very protective of their licenses, right? They've had some issues with cannabis coming into the city. I mean, what is it that's changing mindset-wise? What can people do to bridge that gap between government understanding and actually accepting? Well, as an industry, I think it's our job to make sure that we professionalize. 
right? Because I think that what we're working against right now is so much of a stigma. And I mean, there's so much evidence we even see with the consumer markets. And I, I, I hate to tag this to the Midwest, but when you look at more conservative states, there's this stigma about cannabis that it's weed, it makes you stupid, it makes you dumb, you're a fallout, you're a burnout. All of these sort of visuals that have come really, I believe, from the alcohol industry trying to suppress the cannabis industry after prohibition. Yeah, I think it's a hangover from the Nixonian yeah. era of, you know, uh, that that time and the destabilized nature of America and the yeah. consumption of cannabis being for madness. Right, one side of the equation. And it's interesting to me that you say that because for me, right, the veterans community has been a very strong supporter, right, which you consider to be a conservative, more Republican-driven mindset. But, you know, that the, the veterans community has really adopted this. Even Dana Rohrabacher, right, mm -hmm. was one of the most conservative, ultra-conservative libertarian, was the guy who got the VA to bless medical cannabis. And, and I think that that common ground, I agree, it's the professionalism, it's the lab testing, it's what makes this industry better. So with that being said, yesterday you had uh, the former president of Mexico, Yes. talking about their country may be the first nationalized, the largest nationalized market in the world and is coming soon. What was that like? What, you might even be doing G4 Live in Mexico, I hear. Well, we're talking about it. And, uh, you know, Kenny Mexico is uh, an event that has Mr. Fox, President Fox, uh, had going and they were, they were building it and then COVID came and, you know, they put a pause on it and we almost did the same thing with our event. So I think there was a, a common bond between us in talking about what it means to create an event like this to educate people, but also to create an environment where, you know, people can come and explore and have fun and, and collaborate and network, right? But when you look at what's happening from the event side of things and bringing people together, it's a movement right now that is giving an opportunity to the industry to talk about its growth, to demonstrate it, to show it, to showcase it. And, and that is a really important moment for this industry, again, to remove and shift that stigma away from uh, misconceptions about the plant, because the plant is amazing. But working with Mr. Fox, uh, President Fox was, was a really ex a, a very great conversation I had with him. Actually, we, we spoke yesterday, but we had a uh, time the day before where we just had a conference room conversation with a cup of coffee. And we spoke for about an hour and we talked about his experience and my experience and we found some common bonds and some collaborations and some points to explore and expanding these ideas and what we can do to work together. So, Did, uh, did yeah. he say that, he, that they will be a nationalized market? Does he believe it's happening, it's going gonna, it's gonna to finalize in the, in the months ahead? Well, you know, and I don't want to speak on his behalf, but I will tell you that conversationally he did say that, but he also said that, you know, we're, the challenges in Mexico are very similar to what they are here in the States right now with the government. You know, um, I'm paraphrasing him, but there's a bad president in, 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 in the house, in, 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 you know, running the country right now and who doesn't believe in cannabis, doesn't believe in the plan. Right. And that's suppressing, uh, you know, that's suppressing the industry in Mexico at the moment. It blows my mind that there's so many uh, votes that have proven you know, the majority of Americans have been surveyed that they, that they believe that cannabis should be legalized, right? And regulated. And I get that, right? Then there's this whole idea of the descheduling. And I get that, the criminality element of it. The states will have control of it, much like alcohol. I think it's going to end up looking like alcohol, right, ultimately. I think we can look to that then as, all right, how can we truly have the nationalized concept so companies can access the banking system. And that's where yeah. the federal reality, I think, plays the biggest role. IRS does not allow cannabis businesses in the retail space, especially to write off significant amount of taxes that other businesses don't have to, to pay. You know, they can deduct from their expenses. And then secondly, banking, right? So as the founder of G4 Live, right, have you encountered issues like where structurally you've had to overcome? You don't touch the plant directly. Right? So it, you, do you get my drift though? I think that that's where federal legalization is gonna have the most impact. We've been kicked out of three banks to date and we don't touch the plant. The IRS to me and the government is much like the cartels of Mexico. I mean, when you look at the conversation I had with Mr. Fox, President Fox, I kept, President Fox. Well, you can call him former president. Now, so former president, president Fox. former President Fox is the other one too. Yeah, President Fox. He. Part of our discussion was, was taking the power out of the cartel's hands and putting it in the power of the people. Right. And when he became such an advocate for the plan, he traveled around the world and went to different countries and places that historically allow 
uh, cannabis, like in Amsterdam. He went to different countries and he was looking at what they were doing. And, you know, it, it's very clear to anybody who goes in on that exploration and is an advocate for this plant to see that when you put the power in the people's hands, it doesn't mean that anybody's going to have any issues with, with, with drugs for that matter, let alone in cannabis. What it means is, is that you're taking power out of the people that are going to be hurting you with that product, yeah. stepping on it, or uh, just all the different things that can happen from that plant. But when it comes to banking and when it comes to, it's all part of one ecosystem that's working against the industry. Right. I don't need them to deschedule it per se. They can say as long as it's legal in your state the way they have. But it's for me, it's the banking issue, I think, that really puts the obstacles in front of entrepreneurs, social equity entrepreneurs, and, and institutionalized businesses. But institutionalized businesses will accept some of the higher cost, right, as a burn rate risk for investing into a new and emerging sector. I was telling Dale Sky or somebody earlier, but Uber disrupted taxi cabs the way regulation disrupted cannabis as an industry, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to learn all these terms. And the only ones that I can think of are alcohol and technology in terms of, of those evolutions. But it's a shock to me that someone such as you who's put on such a complex event with so many moving pieces and so many just traditional, I mean, other trade shows in, in different groups use the same services, but that you would have those hurdles, losing your banking three times, simply because you're giving people a forum and a place to discuss ideas and to gather for common ground. And, and that's something that's important to me. You know, politically, common ground is what's going to move this industry forward. And these types of events, and Keith, I mean it, thank you for doing it, because all these people here together are also voters, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, let me ask this question really quick. What is it that I haven't talked to you about yet or I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about with me today? Because I always do that because I will talk sometimes in a, in a political mindset. And we'll get into some dialogues. But really, when you have a guest, you want to know that they said everything they needed to say. So, so lay it on me. Is there anything we haven't, uh, I haven't asked you about? Well, there's nothing. I mean, myself specifically, I, I just I think that for me, I like to be vulnerable and just be myself and not some talking head standing on a stage with a microphone. This is a very humble moment for me to be sitting here with you. Yeah, I mean, we, what people don't understand is how much goes into producing this event. Not just from the logistical aspect of what you see in you know, the lighting and the floors and the couches and the people that are walking the show. It's, it's an emotional battle for this team. And I know you guys experience that too. And anybody who works in this business knows how difficult it is to produce something that makes a profit let alone <laughs> right? pay bills right and, and also an impact too yeah have impact but together and this has been you know what is the outcome we all seek and the outcome we all seek is to lift this industry to a place where we can all monetize and make a profit and live good healthy wonderful lives because we work so hard for it and so I get connected to people like you, Chris, and, and to John, and to everybody on this floor because we all are fighting the same fight. And Keith, from the Cannabis Capital team for the entirety, and I know I can speak for them all, we have a ton of respect for you, but a ton of love as well, and from the entire team, right? And so thank you, everybody. You know, give Keith a round of applause, right? We are all here thank you. Thank to you. meet a vision that started in 2019 that's come to fruition. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, we're good. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you so much for joining us from G4 Live here in Las Vegas for a special edition of Cannabis Capital's Pop Politics. We're going to be here through the weekend. Tomorrow night on Saturday, the 14th of May, we're going to have the Bud Tender Awards. It's going to be an awesome event. It's going to be at the Chaos, uh, Chaos Nightclub yep. at, Chaos the at the Palms. All right. Chaos at the Palms. But there's going to be some really high profile talent performing that night to honor the Bud Tenders. We're going to have Snoop Adela, right? DJ Snoopadelic and Travis Barker doing his drum set together for the first time in a collaboration like no other on a stage in front of the industry. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.